Stormwreck Isle, a graveyard belonging to a variety of dragons from an ancient conflict. Strong magic affects these lands, and whatever occurs in this region, it seems like dragons are at the center of the conflict. Dragons of Stormwreck Isle is an adventure that draws you into the midst of an ancient war among dragons as you explore an island that has been long a battlefield in that conflict. Found in the Dungeons & Dragons starter set, this adventure is meant for those wishing to dip their toes into Dungeons & Dragons. This adventure is a short one that is a great introduction if you enjoy the theme of dragons in your adventure. And make no mistake, there will be dragons. Let us walk through the story that unfolds in the beginner adventure of Dungeons & Dragons, Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. Chapter 1 Dragon's Rest Your adventure begins as you sail to a tiny cloister called Dragon's Rest on the small landmass known as Stormwreck Isle. Seaweed shimmers in countless brilliant colors below you, and rays of sunlight defy the overcast sky to illuminate the lush grass and dark basalt rock of the island. Avoiding the rocks jutting up from the ocean, your ship heads towards a calm harbor on the island's north side. A large, open-air temple comes into view, perched on the edge of a cliff high above you. The ship drops anchor at the mouth of the harbor, and two sailors row you ashore. A long path winds up the side of the cliff to the temple, dotted along the way with doorways cut into the rock. The sailors set you ashore on a rickety dock where a large rowboat is neatly tied. They point to the base of the path and wish you good luck before they row back to the ship. As you're about to leave the beach and start your climb, you hear a ruckus of splashing and a wet gurgling moan behind you. Three figures are shambling up from the water's edge. They're dressed as sailors, but their skin is gray and they look drowned. Seawater drools from their mouths as they lurch towards you and attack. You fend off the creatures and slay them, noting that these sailors have been turned into zombies. Venturing on, you embark on the long path and eventually enter the cloister of Dragon's Rest. Your arrival draws the attention of the entire population of the place, which consists mostly of kobolds. These small, reptilian folk eye you curiously, while a couple of humans watch from a distance. One of the kobolds pipes up with, What's your name? At that, all the kobolds begin barraging you with questions. Where are you from? What's that? Why are you here? Are among the multitude of questions from the curious kobolds. Soon, the chattering kobolds fall silent as a new figure comes into view, descending gracefully from the upper part of the cloister. She's an elderly human woman with weathered brown skin, white hair in tight braids, and kindly hazel eyes dressed in a simple white robe. She smiles as she draws near and extends her arms in greeting. Welcome to Dragon's Rest, she says. May Bahamut's guidance lead you to whatever you seek. She introduces herself as Elder Runara, the leader of Dragon's Rest. She thanks you for your service to the cloister for defeating the zombies earlier. Renara tells you that you're welcome to stay at Dragon's Rest for as long as you wish. You take her up on the offer and begin exploring the cloister. The cloister is a relatively short path that is lined with a few homes and buildings. It leads up the island and ends at a temple dedicated to Bahamut, the platinum dragon that adventurers and dragons alike pray to when upholding justice or when in need of courage. The community in the cloister is made up primarily of kobolds that are friendly as they are curious. Among the kobolds are a few humans of note. An avid botanist named Tarak tends the cloister's garden plots, growing flowers, herbs, and vegetables. He is a middle-aged man with tanned skin and faded tattoos. Tarak is soft-spoken and eager to share his knowledge of herbalism. When you speak with the man, he shares that he wishes to re-establish contact with the Mykonids of the Sea Caves. He asks you to visit the caves on the southwest side of the island find out what's wrong with the Mykonids, and bring him back some hardcap mushrooms. Tarak warns you of the fungal octopus the Mykonids have created as a guardian and tells you that you'll probably have to fight the creature to gain access to the caves. Lastly, he hands you a foul-smelling sack of food scraps you can give the Mykonids as a gesture of friendship. The other human at Dragon's Rest is a woman by the name of Varnoth. Her frame, once tightly muscled, has thinned with age and her light brown skin bears many scars. She is often found working in the temple from where she witnessed a ship change course and crash into the rocks to the north. Varnoth suggests that you might help the island by discovering what caused the crash. 
If you decide to investigate it, Brunaro will tell you that the answer may lie on an older wreck, the wreck of Compass Rose. With some requests lined up from the inhabitants of the island, you decide to set forth on Tarak's request and head to the Sea Caves. Chapter 2 Seagro Caves You travel along the coast of the island to a cliff of dark grey stone towers hundreds of feet above the crashing waves. A swirling slick of color dances on the water surface emanating from the cave. During the low tide, you notice a pathway along the base of the cliffs that leads into the caves and travel along the path into the opening. Multicolored fungus covers the walls of this tunnel, its bioluminescent glow filling the cavern with dim light. The surface of the water swirls with colorful, faintly glowing spores, perhaps reacting to the movement of something under the surface. A spore-servant octopus lurks in the water and attacks you as you enter the tunnel. You fend off the octopus and push past the entrance into the Seagro Caves. The Myconids warn you to leave, but you tell them of Tarak's request and offer them the offerings. After hearing Tarak's name and receiving the offerings, they reluctantly tell you what is going on in Seagro Caves. The Myconids tell you that a foul smell pervades their caves and emanate from the crystal cavern within. Their leader, Sinensa, fell ill after going into that cave to investigate the issue and is now unconscious in their sanctum. Normally, Myconids avoid that cave because sunlight filters into it by way of the vent at the western end of the cave. You decide to investigate the crystal cave and eventually make your way into it. The air in this cave is choked with thick smoke that assaults your nostrils with the pungent odor of brimstone. Strange, flickering orange light illuminates the smoke. This area is free of fungal growth, instead crystals grow from the rock. To your right, a large cluster of purple crystals juts from the stone. On the far wall, a glowing orange crystal wedged into a fissure in the cave wall seems to be the source of the light. Streaks of suit trace a path along the cave walls between the purple crystals and the fissure. Two fume drakes lurk amid the sulfurous fumes and attack you as you enter. You defeat the drakes and continue your investigation. As you explore the cave, you determine that noxious fumes from deep beneath the island seep up around the vein to the surface through a fissure in the west wall. The fissure is now blocked by the enormous orange crystal which is also the source of the light here. You destroy the crystal to allow the noxious fumes to vent out of the caves and eliminate the light source plaguing the myconids. As you break it, a sphere of smoldering obsidian falls to the floor and breaks open, releasing a fire snake that attacks you immediately. You defeat the fire snake and make your way back out of the cave. The myconids are grateful for your aid and invite you to rest for the night as their leader recuperates. You agree, and in the morning, Sinensa, the myconid leader, regains consciousness. Sinensa thanks you for eliminating the toxic fumes and hands you a ruby moral for your efforts. You collect a few of the fungus that Tarak requested and head back to Dragon's Rest where Tarak uses the ruby moral to make an elixir of health for you. Chapter 3 Cursed Shipwreck You decide to investigate the ongoing shipwrecks by traveling to the wreck of Compass Rose. Taking a rowboat at Dragon's Rest, the trip takes you about two hours to reach the wreck. When you arrive, you find waves lapping against a derelict ship lodged against rocks and dragon bones. A faint odor of rot wafts on the sea air, along with the sound of screeching seagulls and the roar of the surf. A tangled mess of tattered sails and riggings hang off the starboard side of the main deck, offering one possible way to climb aboard. You decide to climb aboard the main deck and explore the ship. As you travel through the ship, you fight through zombies, a ghoul, and a harpy. Eventually, you make your way to the ship's hold where you find a chest containing the captain's journal with a braid of hair stuck in the pages. The journal reads, Our journey is ended, though I fear my own is to continue in the most horrible way imaginable. Compass Rose wrecked on a shoal south of Neverwinter. Many sailors perished with the initial impact and Aletha was gravely injured. As I tended her wounds, she clutched her talisman and breathed a soft prayer. I asked her what the talisman signified. She told me love. Her husband waits for her at Dragon's Rest, having pledged his service to the dragon there. The talisman is made from locks of their hair, woven together as a promise to be reunited no matter what fate might befall them. It might have been a beautiful story had it not been for Aletha's gruesome end in the words of the prayer I heard as she breathed her last breath. 
for she was begging Orcus, the prince of undeath, to reunite her with her husband. I held her hands as the breath left her, and I felt a horrible chill pass through her. Next I know, she was sinking her teeth into my neck. At the same moment, I heard moans begin to rise from the dead sailors all around us. What curse has she brought on us all? I already feel a creeping chill overtaking my body. I am securing her talisman with this book in my chest in the hope that someone who comes after us may end this nightmare by bringing Alethas' talisman to her husband. The journal ends there, with the talisman wedged in his pages. You decide to take the talisman back to Dragon's Rest and make your way back to the cloister. Once arriving, you bring the talisman to Renara and explain what you find in the captain's log. Renara nods sadly. She remembers Alethas' husband, Brostos, but he died many years ago. He was laid to rest in the graveyard atop the cliffs at the northern point of the island. You travel to the cemetery and bury the talisman atop Brostos' grave. Soon, thick fog forms around the rocks north of the island. The fog lingers overnight, and when it disperses, no trace of Compass Rose remains. You make your way back to Dragon's Rest having quelled the undead threat. Chapter 4 Clifftop Observatory In Dragon's Rest, Runara decides to summon you to the temple at the top of the cloister. Elder Runara smiles as you approach. I have something to show you, she says. There's a flash, like a silent stroke of lightning, and the human woman is gone. In her place is an enormous dragon with bronze-colored scales. Now you see me as I truly am, she says, tilting her head with an expression that might be a smile on her scaled face. As you discovered, this island has many old wounds, and I'm afraid the cycle of violence is starting again. I have a favor to ask you. Hunara explains that the two families of dragons come into being in the very first days of the world's creation, Bahamut and Tiamat. Bahamut, the noble platinum dragon, made the metallic dragons. The cruel five-headed Tiamat made the chromatic dragons. The metallic and chromatic dragons share a mutual animosity towards each other. The origin of Dragon's Rest is rooted in that animosity. Ages ago, a red dragon called Shuroth rampaged up and down the Sword Coast. Three metallic dragons joined forces to battle Shurath and imprison her beneath the ocean floor keeping her bound forever. Whispers among the chromatic dragons say that she still lives and one day will emerge from her prison. The powerful magic embodied in such an ancient dragon has left a permanent mark on the island. The magic has drawn other dragons to the Stormwreck Isle, making it a recurring battlefield between the chromatic and metallic dragons. A hundred years ago, a blue dragon tried to harness this destructive magic. Runara confronted the blue dragon and pleaded with him to abandon his schemes. When he refused, Runara killed him, adding one more dragon to the grave of the island. Runara has grown weary of strife, and Stormwreck Isle's wounds are a constant reminder to her of the cost of such a conflict. Devoting herself to peace and reconciliation, she established the Cloister of Dragon's Rest as a safe haven from violence. A few months ago, a bronze wormling named Adron came to the island and studied with Runara at Dragon's Rest. Five days before your arrival, he argued with her, angrily rejected her teaching of peace, and stormed away from the cloister. She fears he went to the ancient observatory on the southeast side of the island which is another dragon's final resting place. Hunara suspects some evil has arisen there but she dares not go there herself lest her presence reopen old wounds. In her stead, she requests that you go there and investigate what has transpired. You agree and set forth to the location. Clamoring over the rocky ground of Stormwreck Isle, you spot strange, twisted protrusions of glassy crystal jutting from the earth. The vegetation in this area bears reddish branching scars that form similar shapes. You examine them and notice that this phenomenon is a sign of lightning strikes of a blue or bronze dragon. Suddenly, you hear a screeching roar and notice a winged blue shape swooping overhead. The draconic shape flies past you heading in a similar direction. You decide to press forward and find yourself at a clifftop observatory. Exploring the clifftop observatory, you fight through kobolds that are hostile towards you. Eventually, you find yourself in a hidden library within the structure. Stale air heavy with the smell of old parchment floods your nostrils. The walls are lined with shelves stuffed with old tomes and yellowing scrolls. The sound of splintering wood echoes through the space. 
A moment later, you see an agitated bronze dragon the size of a bear picking himself up from the wreckage of the old desk he apparently crashed into. The bronze dragon wormling excitedly greets you, introducing himself as Adron. He has spent days trying to dig his way out of the caved-in wall, but his efforts from the inside only cause further collapse. Adron explains that five days before you arrived on the island, he left Runaro's tutelage and came to the ancient observatory. When he arrived, he met a blue dragon wormling named Sparkrender, and they immediately fought. Sparkrender attempted to turn Adron against Runara, but Adron's hatred of chromatic dragons was stronger than his disagreement with Runara. Ultimately, Sparkrender overpowered Adron. Adron expresses regret over his inability to defeat the Blue Wormling and concern for the safety of the island's other inhabitants. He tells you that Sparkrender plans to use Adron's death to claim power of all the dead dragons on the island, transforming himself into a mighty Draconic Avatar. Adron decides to face the Blue Dragon once more and flies to the top of the Observatory Tower. You rush off to the top of the tower and follow Adron to defeat Sparkrender. Just as you arrive, you find a strange ritual going underway. Streams of colored light swirl through the air around a golden statue. A blue dragon is perched atop the sculpture, throwing his head back in pain or ecstasy as the light surround him and he unleashes a bolt of lightning up toward the sky. At the base of the statue, Adron is bound to the ground by three heavy chains and looks to be in agony. You rush over to the bronze wormling and free Adron from his chains. The two of you together defeat Sparkrender and thus prevent the strange ritual from continuing. With Adron in tow, you return victorious to Dragon's Rest. Runara grieves the death of Sparkrender as another draconic death on the island, but is pleased by Adron's safe return. She welcomes you to stay at Dragon's Rest for as long as you wish. If you yearn to continue your adventuring life, Runara supplies you with whatever you may need for your travel and a welcoming home for you to return to. Hello everyone! I hope you enjoyed the story of Dragon to Stormwreck Isle. This adventure is one that was fairly short and I thought I'd uh, do in the meantime. Currently I'm working on Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel, although that one is a lot of adventures to go through, so it'll take some time. Uh, most of it is mainly recording. Recording takes quite a bit of time. And editing does too. Um, for my last few ones, I've edited a lot less because uh, it's just so much work. But uh, I thought I'd do this one since it's a short and quick one. Hopefully you enjoy it, and uh, yeah, if you uh, like what you watch, please uh, give me a subscribe and like. Thanks!